of racial justice. And we recruit 10 scholars every year. And we provide a suite of services that includes uh, three-year tuition, full tuition scholarship. Uh, we also pay for relocation fees to law school. Uh, we include books. We include uh, technology fees so that you can uh, have laptops and all of those things. So all the, the costs associated with attending school, your room and board, food, uh, all of those incidentals that are associated with going to school. That's one critical part um, and probably one of the most appealing parts of the program. But beyond that, what we also offer are very uh, intentional professional development opportunities that begin with your summer internships uh, in, in law school. So each summer of law school, we have partner organizations that are national, regional, and local civil rights organizations practicing on behalf of black communities in the South. Uh, uh, these organizations also have offices in the South. Uh, and so our students begin to learn very early the critical skills that they'll need uh, to not only be effective practitioners, but to be practitioners who have long careers, uh, to, to have sustainable careers. Uh, so, so that piece, the internship piece, is a very critical part of the beginning of the development of our scholars uh, 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 becoming civil rights lawyers. Beyond that, once you graduate, we assist with the process of uh, passing the bar, taking and passing the bar, and then we also provide a two-year fellowship, postgraduate fellowship after law school. In that two-year fellowship, you work with national and uh, uh, regional civil rights organizations as an attorney uh, in your first two years, a young budding attorney. Uh, as a fellow at their at their law offices practicing law in the South. And so you'll expand that skill development set. And after that two-year post-graduate uh, fellowship, we will support you in the development of your career for the first eight years of your career as a civil rights lawyer practicing in the South. So combined, that's three years of law school, two years of fellowship, and eight years of uh, committed practice in the South for a total 13-year commitment. Uh, that is the, what you give in return to uh, g gaining ad admission and being accepted into the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And so as you see, it's a very comprehensive program. And we, we thought that because of the time that we're living in, it's very clear that we need uh, a unique response to the social justice and racial justice issues that we're seeing in America. And we also need an insurance policy of sorts. And our Marshall Motley Scholars are an insurance policy to ensure that the legacy of civil rights law that began uh, with, with LDF under our founder, who the program is named after, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, we want to ensure that the work we began in 1940 can continue. And so as you can imagine, this program has uh, a lot of prestige that comes with it, right? Also, but it comes with a lot of, of responsibility. Uh, the program is named after Thurgood Marshall, the first black Supreme Court justice and the founder of LDF, and Constance Baker Motley, who was a force to be reckoned with, the first black woman uh, to, to be appointed to the federal bench. And so these are two powerhouses uh, <laughs> that the program sends in their legacy, in the light of their legacy. And we are recruiting and looking for young people who have a mind young lawyers who have a mind, and not young in age, but young in the, in the process of developing as a lawyer. Uh, we're looking for, 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 for budding lawyers who are looking to commit to a life, and not a new commitment, but an extension of a commitment that they've already demonstrated over the past years. And so what we hope you'll gain from our talk today is a bit more insight into the application process, what you can expect, and also hear from our scholars to know more about their their personal experiences so far uh, in the, as a member, members of the first cohort. So you can get real-time answers from people who have uh, walked the path that you've walked before. And so with that being said, I want to turn it over to Adria Kimbrough, who's our recruiting manager. And she's going to talk a little bit about the process of applying for the program, uh, a, little, a little bit about the uh, uh, scholars and give you an, an, an introduction to the scholars. And we'll give them the chance to tell you a bit about who they are, where they're from. And then we'll get to your questions and answers, because I think that that's the most important thing for today is that you walk away feeling empowered, knowing what the program is about, knowing if it resonates with you and who you are and the work that you want to do. Um, but just know from my perspective, if you are a budding lawyer who has a passion for racial justice, uh, social justice in, in, in general, but racial, racial justice more specifically, uh, if you have a connection and a heart and a passion for people in the South, the Southern region of the United States, and you see a particular need for lawyers who are serving intentionally the, the interests of black communities in the South, then uh, this program is certainly for you, and we're glad that you, you're here. So without further ado, I'll pass it to Adria Kimbrough, and she will take it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gino, and it is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, this morning. 
Um, Gino, talk to you about the, the, the mission of MMSP. And I think it's important for you to know that this is not a new investment on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, our organization has a history of investing in the South and in the development of lawyers in the South. So many people know the name Thurgood Marshall. Of course, that is our founder. Um, and of course, the first African-American on the United States Supreme Court. However, um, there are other names all throughout the South, people like Julius Chambers uh, from North Carolina, who really uh, are the epitome of what we're looking for in our Marshall Motley Scholars, people who are going to be on the ground in communities throughout the South working on behalf uh, of communities for racial justice. Um, and that's what we're looking for uh, last year, and that's what we're certainly looking for again this year. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about the application process for this year. Um, it is available on our website, so you can and log in right away, and you'll be able to see the components. Um, they're very similar in nature to some of the things that you will need to apply to law school. Um, your personal statement, um, there's an essay about your experience uh, with racial justice on behalf of communities in the South, and to be able to speak to that. Um, we will also be looking for resume, transcript, um, or a test score, either the LSAT or the GRE score, whichever test you do take uh, for the purposes of applying to law school. Three letters of recommendation as well. And then finally, the video that uh, will allow you to have the opportunity to talk about how you're currently living the life of a Marshall Motley Scholar. Um, and that is one of our favorite parts because it gives us an opportunity to see the fullness of the applicant. Um, so all of those uh, pieces are available on the website. We also have a handy application guide available on the website as well that will be able to give you some guidance as you uh, move through the application. Um, the application is currently open. We're excited about um, it's been open since November, and some of you may have already applied or be in the process of applying. But for those of you who are not, we invite you, as Gino said, those of you who have a heart and a commitment for racial justice, we invite you to take a look at the application and complete it and allow us to consider you as one of the next Marshall Motley Scholars. Uh, the application will be open until February the 11th, which is exactly one month from today. Um, and so you've got plenty of time. You've got plenty of time. Um, we are looking for you, and we hope that you will give yourself an opportunity to be considered for this transformative opportunity. And with that, um, I want to take an opportunity to introduce the two lovely, fantastic folks that we've got joining us today. Um, Ms. Brianna Hayes and Kendall Long, both of whom are part of our inaugural cohort of Marshall Motley Scholars. And I'm, actually, I think I want to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about where they're from, where they're currently attending law school, and then we'll invite them into the conversation. Mm. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Hayes. Um, I grew up in Baxley, Georgia. I am currently attending the University of Georgia School of Law, where I actually also received my bachelor's. Go dogs! We had a big win last night. But I'm so excited to be here today and to discuss the program with everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Excited for this to turn out here on the webinar. My name is Kendall Long. I'm originally from DeSoto, Texas, right outside of Dallas. I'm a 2019 graduate of Georgetown University and I'm a 1L at NYU School of Law in New York. And to look forward to discussing more with everyone. All right, thank you both. And so let's talk a little bit about what of you guys were in the seat that many of the individuals here today are a year ago, you were in this very same seat. So talk to us a little bit about what interested you in the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And Kendall, uh, we'll, we'll start with you and then hear from Brianna. Sure. Um, I think uh, one thing that's hard to deny is like the, the, the tremendous value that the financial support has for law school. Um, law school is, of course, very expensive. 
Um, and one thing for me, I knew that the money was going to be determinant for me and where I would go to law school. And so with the Marshall Miley Scholarship, I knew if, if I received it, it would open up more options if I'd be able to make the decision as, as separate from the financial costs that would have to be incurred for law school. And so I think that's, uh, I think that's hard to avoid in, in considering the scholarship. Uh, but also, I was uh, someone who was uh, committed to uh, working in racial justice after I graduated undergrad. Uh, that's what led me to want to apply to law school in the first place. So I, I knew I wanted to to do that um, uh, with with the law degree, and I deeply valued having a, a cohort. Uh, I think it's uh, it's important it's been important for me to have this cohort um, because law school is uh, undoubtedly hard uh, as a student of color, as a student interested in working in public interest, as a student. Uh, from the South and returning to the South. At some schools, each of these separately are underrepresented in the in law school community, and I knew that going into law school. And so uh, one thing that stuck out to me about Marshall Miley's fellowship program was having this cohort to to traverse through law school uh, of these like-minded individuals that shared this overlap of identities, shared this overlap of goals, investments, and uh, potential for the world for, for Black people in the South. Um, and so that was important for, uh, for me and uh, uh, something that stood out made me want to apply for the, for the scholarship program. Well, for me, growing up in South Georgia and then rural South Georgia on top of that, I lived through a lot of injustices um, in the school system, to the education system. You know, I, I faced it all. And I saw my peers who were also my color face so many things um, simply because we grew up in the South. And so living through all of those injustices, I noticed them, right? But I didn't see a lot of people who were there to address them. And I wanted to be the person that could address, address those injustices. And I knew that um, the Marshall Motley Scholars Program was a great program to prep me to one day go back to South Georgia if I ever had the opportunity and um, flip the script on the narrative that is the narrative of so many black people in the South and especially in rural places. So I really saw the program again as an opportunity to be trained, to go back and change things. And that's ultimately why I applied. And then obviously, like Kendall said, um, it relieves such a great financial burden. And so that was also very appealing to me too. And it's made law school a lot easier to know that that financial burden isn't on me. Absolutely. Appreciate your, your thoughts about the commitment and the burden, because that's really one of the things that um, is the impetus for this program, because that financial barrier often stands in the way of students like you who want to pursue and, and have a genuine, authentic interest in pursuing um, this kind of career that may not be as financially lucrative, um, but certainly one that um, has a significant impact and purpose and being able to remove the barrier is just a huge, um, huge win uh, for the program and for the students and for our society at large. Um, so but with that, I believe we have Angela Winfield here from the Law School Admissions Council. I want to invite her to join us um, in this conversation. Angela, are you there? I am here. I am here. Thank you so much, Adria. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm a, I apologize. I couldn't be with you earlier, but I am absolutely delighted to have this conversation um, because uh, as the law school uh, admissions council chief diversity officer and with our commitment, diversity, and inclusion, it is just so important to partner with and make uh, a, a participants like yourself aware of these wonderful programs to support you. So thanks for inviting me into the conversation. And if I may, you know, hearing the stories from these scholars, I would just love to ask you, um, you talked about your commitment and interest in civil rights and pursuing a career in law. I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about how did you approach that application? You know, I know you have a commitment, but when you saw the application come through, what were your first thoughts and how did you approach applying? How did you put your best foot forward? And, you know, provide some advice to some folks who are might, who might be thinking about applying and just aren't sure yet. I think sometimes whenever we go to apply to something and we're writing out our resume, we feel the need to think of, oh my gosh, how can I make what I did here applicable to this application or how can I stretch things or how can I 
make it seem like I, I did more. And for me, it wasn't like that because I, I, did, I felt like the application was made for me. So the two or three things that I did as it pertained to racial justice, I just, that's how I, I approached the application by simply telling my story. Um, it was authentic. It wasn't forced. It wasn't scripted. It was just everything I did and why I did it. So I would say to anyone who's applying, don't worry about if you did enough or if how much you did. Think about what you did do and why you did do it. Um, and I think that goes a long way in making your application stand out. And ultimately, that's the approach that I took. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with what Brianna said. I think one thing that stuck out to me when I was drafting my application materials was on this webinar last year and the Marshall Mali website was that the thing that stuck out was the evidence commitment. And for me, I look back, going all the way back to high school, looking at like old application essays, even for undergraduate, looking at journals and things like that, touching on what Brianna said about to get to the to the why that I, that. Uh, that I did all the activities that I was involved in uh, from and, I, and for me it was being able to trace a connective thread from activities in uh, high school to undergrad to my post uh, undergrad experiences and be able to connect that to like a, a similar question I think that the general law school materials ask like why law school and why law school now and so I think that the not just um, emphasis on what Brianna said the talking about the why uh, behind of what she did it is really important I think, um, and also we'll give uh, you all credit, it is, a, um, it is an intense application. I, I, I don't think we can shy away from that. And we definitely felt that uh, last year as well with the novel cohort. Um, but one thing that I think that we benefited from was that uh, there was no existing cohort. There was the, the first year. Um, uh, so we really had to bring your authentic self to the application. So there wasn't necessarily a, a model applicant necessarily to, to match yourself against. And so I, I would encourage uh, applicants this year to, even though that there is a cohort now, to try to embody that same uh, mindset of like not necessarily comparing yourself to other students that have received other um, other scholarships, not comparing yourself to the current cohort members. Um, uh, what Adria said about uh, uh, well, they're looking for you, they're looking for your application, uh, that that really is true. And so I think you should really strive to tell your authentic story about your your uh, investments, your motivations, your explanations about what brings you to this work. Um, and, I, and I think that that was important. And, and, and just breaking that down, it took a lot of drafting and redrafting and throwing out when I was throwing out. Uh, prior to my essays that it didn't sound like I was talking like myself or it sounded like I was trying to paint a certain picture or whatnot. So I definitely encourage that same, um, uh, apply, apply that same rigor to yourself, and which is difficult of, of bringing authentic stuff to these application materials. Um, yes. and, and be honest, and I think one, one thing that was important in the application process, it's, it's a 13 year commitment, which is a daunting commitment then now that we're at 12 and a half years for us that, that have started the cohort, it's still a daunting thing. And so I think that's something to be honest about in the application, because uh, I think that is another uh, big question that the panel, uh, the selection panel will be seeking is, is are, are you really invested for this uh, three years of law school, the 10 years following, um, and how you, can, how you evidence that? Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and both of you, if you could, and maybe um, we'll start with you, Brianna, and then go to you, Kendall, for this. What is it like being a part of the first cohort of the um, Marshall Motley Scholars Program? What is the impact that you're receiving now? I know you talked a little bit about the financial, but are there other benefits that you see um, of being part of this program? These, the cohort these people are my best friends. And I, I mean that with the most, sin, most sincere heart. Um, and I know they're my friends because whenever one of us makes a great big accomplishment, they celebrate with us. Um, or if we're ever in a down spot, I've got people I can call and they'll be there for me. I remember moving into my apartment, not having something. And one of the scholars was like, Oh, I'll send it to you. You know, it, it's just, we authentically love each other and knowing that you have that support across the country because we've got people here down in Georgia, we've got people at Berkeley, at um, Harvard, you know, so 
it, there are so many people in so many different places, but you feel the love from afar. And it really means a lot to know that somewhere, someone somewhere is going through the exact same thing that you're going through, but just in a different place. And I know it might not really make sense, but I think it takes being a part of the cohort to feel that connectedness um, that really kind of like takes you throughout the day and gives you encouragement. So I think that has, has been a lot of help. And then I would also say, um, Mr. Gino, Miss Adria, Miss Tiffany, everyone um, at LDF through the Marshall Motley Scholars Program has been a lot of help too. Miss Adria, I think I've had three or four conversations with her throughout my first semester talking about grades, talking about how to outline, talking about adjusting, period. And she's been there and she's given me her advice. And so just to have that support from her has meant a lot too. I think overall, just to kind of put a bow on everything, um, you are supported in ways that your classmates are not supported. And I think that goes a long way. And when I say supported, yes, financially supported, but I'm more so talking about socially supported um, by your peers who are going through your same experiences and then by people who are older than you who have been there, done that, and can tell you the best route to go. So that, I think, has been the most help to me. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Brianna, for sharing that because um, as a person who's gone through law school myself and you know, knowing the importance of having that community, having that support of people who are going through the same things that you're going through, as well as the experience of folks like Gino and Andrea, is so important on staying on the right track and following that path when you come up against obstacles and barriers. So thank you for sharing that. Kendall, how about you? What are some of the other benefits of being a part of this cohort? Yes, I, I, just, I think when you first answered the question, uh, me and Brianna both uh, just kind of like gleamed in the face. Now it's, it's such a genuine reaction. I think I'm really appreciative of how dynamic our cohort is. Uh, Brianna mentioned uh, all the law schools there right now, but it's similar diversity for our undergrad institutions, folks that went to HBCU that are not going to PWIs for law school or vice versa, folks that came straight through from undergrad uh, um, or folks that have uh, worked a bit after undergrad in between law school. So I really appreciate that the um, the diversity within our cohort of, of identities. Um, and I think that makes for, it's important because it makes for a really rich um, cohort as we go through these 13 years together. Even now, as we have like discussion and thinking about what it means for us to be civil rights lawyers in a time where there's like a growing disdain for voting or politicians in the courts, we may disagree on like what that, what the answer to that is, but because we have these different um backgrounds that we're approaching the program with and approaching law school with, I think it makes this for a rich uh, camar camaraderie that we're building both like on all of the, uh, the, the personal elements that Brianna mentioned, but also even like the professional training is starting now. And about the, the, about the support piece, uh, I think that's definitely something uh, that's hard to kind of engage at the, at the beginning of like applying for the scholarship. But I think uh, for one, just from like the, the two um, momentous figures that like are the namesakes of organizations from being at attached to uh, LDF, that comes with so much support. I've, I've realized that there are people that have had different touch points with either uh, uh, Judge Motley or, or Justice uh, Marshall or uh, working with LDF at different points. And so, like, when I mentioned I'm a Marshall Motley scholar through LDF, and so I interned uh, at LDF, or I worked at LDF, or I received a scholarship from LDF, or I clerked for one of the judges or justice. Um, so that's something, that that network of support that um, that isn't even, I guess, directly connected to Marshall Motley Scholarship Program, but that's still aware of the program and still willing to lend support because of uh, what's tied to it, because of the name and the organization. I think that's something that's definitely uh, blown, blown me away. Um, and I'll uh, uh, think more tangibly in the fall, like we received uh, academic coaching sessions throughout the throughout the semester. So that's something Brianna touched on as well as well, getting advice on how to outline and how to do exam prep. Um, before the semester started, we had a retreat where we kind of unpacked about what it means to be a Marshall Motley Scholar um, in this current moment and uh, understood our assignment as, as um, we often uh, call it uh, among the scholars about our assignment of being a Marshall Motley Scholar. So it's that the financial support, of course, but also like the uh, reiterating reiter what Brianna said, um, the professional, personal, social support as well as uh, is tremendous. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kendall, because I think you bring out a few things that are really important. And one of them 
is just the name and the recognition and the solidity of that support of the Marshall Motley Scholars, you know, looking at those namesakes and also looking at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as itself, as an incredible organization. And to be a part of that opens so many doors. Um, for me, I was a Herbert Lehman Scholar as an undergrad. Um, and to see how, um, to, the, how there's so many connections that you see along the way and all of the people that came before and that are doing the work now and that you will be the future um, leading civil rights and justice um, in the legal industry is just so amazing to be a part of that virtuous cycle. So before we open up and get some questions um, from you all as attendees, hopefully you're putting in your questions to the Q&A feature. Um, we've got people on the back end helping sort those, and we'll get to those just momentarily. But before we do that, I want to turn back to um, you, Gino, and you, Adria. Is there anything else that you want to add about the Marshall Motley Scholars Program? I know you went through some of the details of it, and it is much more than a scholarship program. It is a wonderful opportunity. Can you please share some you know, final thoughts on what you want students and, and potential applicants to know about the program? Adria, do you want to go first? Sure, happy to do that, Angela. Um, I think we'll probably get to some of the nuts and bolts in the Q&A section, but the only thing that I would say is don't talk yourself out of this. Don't talk yourself out of this. There will be some of you who will hear this and say, this sounds great, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm the right person. Or maybe you'll even go an additional step and look at the application itself. And you'll say, I'm not the person that they're looking for. You'll talk yourself out of it. Um, my challenge to you is to give yourself this opportunity, avail yourself to this opportunity. Yes, you are the one that we're looking for. Don't talk yourself out of it. I'll pass it to Gina. Thank you, Adria. I think that pretty much summed it up for me. You know, yes, you, we are looking for you. We are looking for folks just like you who have a passion to help others, who have a passion to make life better, who when they read the news and they're surfing on social media and they're seeing issues that are happening in real time to real people in real places, they say, I want to be in those places, helping those people. We're looking for you when your heart lights up because you know that there's more that can be done. And you know that there's something inside of you that's always been there saying, this is something I must do. Um, if, if that's who you are, if it's, if it's like breathing for you to make life better for people and particularly for black communities in the South, this is for you. You don't have to be from the South. You don't have to be born in the South. You don't have to currently live in the South. You have to demonstrate that you have a passion and a commitment uh, to be in that space and to be helping people with the types of issues that we're talking about. But just because you're out in, in uh, uh, Washington State or Oregon or California or Hawaii or Alaska, you know, uh, we, 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 we welcome everyone. We welcome everyone who has those three prongs that we're looking for, you know, a demonstrated commitment to racial justice and to practicing civil rights on behalf of black communities in the South um, and who are willing to make that commitment for 13 years. And I always say this, you know, the Marshall Motley Scholar is not someone who commits because they become a Marshall Motley Scholar. They become a Marshall Motley Scholar because they were already committed. Um, and so be able to show us your demonstrated commitment. Um, if you're not new to this, but you've been true to this, then yes, you. We're looking for you and we welcome your application. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, Javier, I'm going to turn to my colleague from LSAC. We have some questions coming through in the uh, Q&A. Yes. Uh, let's see if I can start my video here. Yes, we have actually a uh, uh, Thank you so much for all the questions. They're incredibly interesting, but many uh, aspirants are... Um, Asking specifically to timelines, deadlines, uh, at what point in their in their uh, law education career should they be applying? Okay, and, uh, if you're in 2L, can you apply? If the, uh, if you're still in your undergrad, can you apply? If you could um, speak to those uh, requirements, I'm sure a lot a lot of our questions will be answered over here. Sure. Um, so as Gino mentioned, you know, we are looking for people with a demonstrated commitment to uh, work on behalf of black communities in the South for racial justice. 
Um, that is the requirement. We're looking for people who are currently in the process of applying to law school for the fall of 2022. Um, that's really the, the own requirement, um, the administrative commitment, of course. But in terms of eligibility, uh, that's what we're looking for. So if you're a 2L or if you're someone who is already in law school, unfortunately, um, the opportunity is not um, does not fit in terms of the timeline for you. Because as uh, Brianna and Kendall mentioned, we're looking for individuals who will be able to go along as a cohort throughout the entire experience. And so if you've already started law school, unfortunately, um, this opportunity um, will not be the right fit. Um, likewise, um, there may be some of you who are in your first year of college, you know, earlier on in your career. Um, and certainly we want to stay in touch with you. We want to be in communication with you. But in terms of the application that's open right now, we are looking for individuals who intend to law to start law school in the fall of 2022. All right, and Adria, just to clarify, so you have to be applying and looking to attend in the fall, so does that mean that you have to be a senior in college right now, or can I already have uh, my bachelor's degree or some other degree? Oh, absolutely. In okay. fact, um, it, with the applicant pool last year, the majority of folks who applied had taken at least a year off. So this is not just for people who are seniors in college or for working professionals. It's for anyone, regardless of what stage you are in your educational career. If you intend to start law school in the fall of 2022, you can submit an application to be considered for this opportunity. Okay, wonderful. And then so if I say this sounds like something I want to do, I'm going to apply. When do I need to submit my application by and where do I get that application? February the 11th is the application deadline. So you have um, exactly one month to prepare and submit your application. The application is available online on our website. I think that that may have been shared in the chat before, um, but I'm sure if not, we'll be able to do that before we sign off here today. And the application is there online. It will walk you through it. We also have an application guide that gives some, some direction on each component of the application that hopefully will assist you as you work on it and complete and submit it. And then if I go ahead and I apply and I get my application in before the deadline, um, when will I hear something? What happens after I apply? Yes, so the application, uh, once the application closes, we will begin the review process. Um, by March, we will have selected finalists. And by April, we will have announced and we'll have selected our next and second cohort of Marshall Motley Scholars. So the goal is indeed to try to have this process complete um, and align with the timeline that many law schools have uh, asked for prospective students to commit and make a decision on where they will attend. We know, I think Brianna and Kendall both talked about how um, the benefit of the scholarship informed their decisions on school and how, how it just really impacted that. So um, our goal is to make sure that we have decisions made in time um, to allow that information to be able to inform the student's decision on where they will attend law school. Wonderful. So what I'm hearing is that I don't need to have made a decision about where I'm going to law school, um, that I'll have a decision about the scholarship and whether I'm in the program before I need to commit to a school. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. All right, fantastic. Um, Javier, are there any other questions um, um, yes. in the Q&A? <laughs> yes, there are some very interesting ones. There are a couple of questions regarding the commitment, but I'm going to read one particular question that I think sums up the dozens of others. It says, I am interested in the commitment after the fellowship. I am committed to continuing my focus on civil rights, but I'm also interested in criminal justice focus on race, more specifically, and also education law that focuses on the cradle to personal pipeline. Can you share about the guidelines around the 10 year post grad and what is included in the civil rights law commit? Gina, do you want to take that question since I did the last? All right. Yes. Um, so, the things that, that in that particular question that were mentioned actually can fall under the scope of civil rights law practice. Many of the, the uh, civil rights organizations across the country are working 
uh, with those issues as well. Uh, they fall under that umbrella. What you're looking at in the practice of civil rights law you, is you're going to be looking at practicing. So you're going to be you're going to be involved in litigation. Um, you're going to be working for a law firm that is bringing cases on behalf of black people in the South uh, to intentionally uh, erase, to, 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 to undo, to ensure uh, all things related to justice and, and the liberties and securing the liberties for folks in the South to ensure that 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 all of the justice and all of the rights in our society are extended equally to all people, particularly in the region where most black people are still existing and where most of those uh, uh, ills are still kind of most present. And so when you talk about civil rights, so you're looking at national and regional state and local civil rights organizations uh, who practice in that area. You're looking at uh, solo law firms who may be doing civil rights law work, but have a 75% or more of their caseload uh, is civil rights law in pursuit of racial justice. Uh, the racial justice piece is very, uh, is very key uh, in the work that's being done here. Um, and then you can work for uh, certain government offices. There are certain government lawyers, the Department of Justice, uh, Civil Rights Division, things of that sort. Very narrow uh, options to work within the government. Uh, a state uh, civil rights office uh, in, in their Department of Justice and in their Division of uh, Justice there. But a broader, more um, separate focus of just like practicing educational law and advocating for special education rights on behalf of individuals, uh, that wouldn't necessarily qualify as the type of work that we're doing. Uh, the type of work that we're looking at is more systemic work. Uh, we're looking for lawyers who are going to be dismantling systems. Uh, a lot of that is more larger scale impact litigation, things of that sort. So as you're thinking about having an interest in education, I was a former teacher. I had I came to the table with interest in education, uh, educational equity um, and policies and things of that sort. But that found its home very squarely situated in the umbrella of civil rights. Uh, a lot of people come with the idea of wanting to pursue criminal law. Uh, if you were wanting, wanting to be a public defender, this program is not your program. Uh, if you want to be a prosecutor, this program is not your program. But if you want to work on issues of more systemic criminal justice issues, if you want to talk about uh, uh, ending the death penalty, if you want to talk about um, uh, these broad state sentencing re requirements in certain areas that are disproportionately affecting black people and thereby limiting their ability to, to move forward in other ways, those are the types of things that you would be interested in doing. Then this is the type of program that will allow you the space to do those things. Wonderful. Thank you, Gino. That is really helpful. Javier, do we have another yes. question from the, the... Yes, we do. We have so many. I'm so excited. Uh, the, 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 we have several questions from international students. Uh, impressive that we have students logged into the webinar from the UK, from Uganda, uh, from Italy. Uh, and they want to know if... Uh, you know, they're pursuing their bachelor's degree internationally right now, but they're interested in becoming a cohort member if, if they can apply or if they're eligible. Dino, do you want to address that one? I want to make sure I understand the question. So if they're applying, if they have a degree from an international school and they're applying to attend law school in the United States, Yes. And they want to know if they're eligible. Well, that could that could go a couple of different ways, right? So if someone has received a degree in another country and they live here now and they're permanent resident um, and they intend to stay and remain here and work, then they would be eligible to apply to the program if they're attending a accredited a U.S. Uh, accredited law school, a law school that's accredited by the ABA, um, and they intend to work in the South and live in the South and be, be a civil rights lawyer practicing on behalf of Black communities. Uh, that's a possibility. However, if it's someone who's coming and getting a degree and expecting to return home, uh, there's going to be that that issue of needing to stay and be eligible to work in the United States for those eight years. So that person under those circumstances may not be eligible. Um, however, if a if the applicant who is intending to remain and work and live in the United States, one thing I will say to that applicant is 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 you you will apply where you will spend strategically a part of your application, I think, is in helping the committee understand where the intention for you has grown to, to live here in America, work on these issues, and be here for uh, that 13-year commitment in the program. Uh, so you'd have to be able to, to demonstrate that um, in your application in a way 
that would be compelling to the to the community. Very good. So there is an expectation of permanent residency that you have to demonstrate that you will be here um, and be practicing in the South in the U.S. Right. Yes, and that's because of the eight-year uh, requirement to work. Uh, unfortunately, our program cannot uh, sponsor visas or anything of that sort uh, for for people who are not eligible to work in the United States. Uh, so we have to have the requirement of people having the uh, authority to work and, and authorization to work in the country. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Let's see, Javier. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yeah. I'll summarize a couple of questions here regarding the the review process. If all the aspects of the of the application are reviewed with equal weight, and also there's a question, or there are a couple of questions about if they're taking the LSAT in February, if they should wait until the next until, until the next fall to apply, and if there's an age requirement uh, to apply. Sure, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll okay. there. Um, so number one, no, there's not an age requirement. <laughs> as long as you're starting law school in the fall of 2022, you can be any age at all. Um, so no age requirement. Um, I think the other question may have been about whether each part of the application is given equal weight. And the answer to that is yes. So the, the actual components of our application are not given any particular weight, but we have certain key uh, factors that are important for the mission of our program, um, specifically around commitment to black communities, commitment to the South, um, and commitment on working on behalf of racial justice. And so the key is how do all of those components of the application woven together demonstrate those commitments and that's the way in which the evaluation um or the application will be evaluated javier i think there was a second what? question you threw in there that i, that I um about the dates for the uh, oh, oh the date yes right. yes so um unfortunately a february lsat date um will not and that's assuming because i think the february test may be a little bit later in february after our application deadline so unfortunately, if you've not taken the LSAT prior to the application deadline, you would not be eligible for oh, this year. Yeah. Okay. Um, however, if you took the, t uh, the test in January and you're awaiting your scores, you could go ahead and submit your application and then um, include that that score. But unfortunately, February test takers, if that's your first and first time you don't have an LSAT score, um, you would not be uh, eligible for this application. I'm not eligible. Okay. Good. So essentially, you have to have all the components. You've had some sort of standardized test score completed by February 11th. Even if you don't have the score back yet, you have to have, have taken the test. You have to now. Yes, that's great. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Thank I'm you, Gino. Thank you, Adria. Thank you, um, uh, Brianna. And um, thank you. I'm glad to do it. But um, they, they are paying me to go to school for three years. For I have to get them eight years of service. For being so honest the and forthright about the program, about the commitment, who I tried to get to help me while I was in jail, but wouldn't help me. That's the irony. They are paying me to go to school and like give us that program. Programs like this are critically and, um, important, not only for you as what? students who are interested in practicing the legal defense fund, the NAACP, they split up from the NAACP because the NAACP don't want to do anything. They just want to take your money. Um, our system oh, more so, towards yeah. justice. Um, it is an absolute pleasure for LSAC to Total bring you this opportunity to make you aware of it. We hope hours. that you explore the website marshallmonthlyscholars.org to learn more about it. And also, feel free to visit lsac.org. There's a number of resources available. We have other programs for pre-law students. Um, if you are, if this is not the right program huh? for you, there are other opportunities like the pre-law undergraduate scholars that will be opening soon as well. So please just explore your opportunities. If you have further questions, again, visit those websites and reach out with those. I wish you all the best. And again, thank you for attending and good luck on your journey. Okay. Okay.
Oh, I gotta take the. Oh, gosh. Hmm.